Okay, everybody, um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to um, the, with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. We're delighted to have Don Reamer here tonight to talk about his new book, as well as to answer your many questions about birding. Um, we've had over 20 questions submitted just in the registration. And the way we're gonna work tonight is that Don is going to be showing um, some slides and talking about um, this, the, talking about his book, and then afterwards, um, he will start addressing some of those birding questions. So um, I'm going to ask Don to take it away. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Carney, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm broadcasting from the man cave tonight, so uh, here we go. So uh, people, uh, I guess, realize that now that I have written a book, it's called Seeing Anything Good. Seasons of Birds in Midcoast Maine. And even though that title's a little bit misleading because it, many of the essays in there apply much broader than just the Midcoast area. There are themes and concepts that's in conservation and so forth that uh, go well beyond the Midcoast area. So anyway, having said that, um, this cover photo is actually was taken uh, right here in Warren one May morning, some years back when the I looked up and an osprey was flying directly at me with uh, an elwive in his, in his grasp. And uh, I just picked the camera up and just let her blast. And I happened to get some pretty good photos. So I thought, well, I'll probably never write a book. But if I do, that might be the cover. So that's sort of how that, that one worked out. Um, so the, the title itself, Seen Anything Good, it's, it's a common expression that uh, birders often use when they meet each other on the trail or wherever. They're out and they're looking around and uh, they see another birder and they see binoculars. And often they will say, hey, seen anything good? Well, that's, uh, that's an open question because... Uh, so uh, you'll see all kinds of birders afield. This is down at West Keg Marsh in the South Thomaston. And uh, you'll see people who have lots of big, heavy, uh, expensive equipment. You'll see folks with uh, just a pair of binoculars around their neck. And that's the beauty of birding. It, it's for everyone, really. It isn't just for, for people uh, you know, who have uh, big, uh, expensive equipment. And I've always tried to and in, in the columns that I've written through the years, I've always tried to encourage folks to be curious about birds and not don't just stop when you when you get one identified, but delve into it a little bit and really watch watch what it does. So um, when people say to me, uh, when other birders I meet say, seen anything good? Well, I, I'll often say, well, they're all good, but that's sort of a cop out in a way. <laughs> but really, the term "good" is a real is a relative term, and um, what might be a good bird for one person might be just what they call a trash bird for someone else. Like people will say, "Well, gee, I saw I saw a starling," and others will say, "Oh, that's just a trash bird," because they're common, they're numerous. But the thing is that all birds uh, are interesting, and particularly when you get into watching their behavior, which is that's one of my key elements is to really watch what they do. And it looks like the folks in this, this is in Warren Village and all these folks here came from Massachusetts and beyond in May to photograph uh, the uh, ospreys because the river is such there that it's, it's fairly narrow and, and the birds just get focused right in, right in below them, right at their feet. One fellow told me that he has ospreys at home where he lives in Massachusetts, but he could get more good osprey shots in a day in Warren than he'd get in a week at, at home. So that's why people come. It's also a big part of our economy here in Maine. The outdoor stuff, as you know, is, is big in Maine. So, uh, and you know, it doesn't apply to, to adults, uh, it can now this guy here, my grandson, he was 18 months old when this photo was taken, and he had taken two binoculars already. Uh, not that I encouraged him, but yeah, I did. 
but he was having a really good bird here because he was watching an American robin in the driveway. So for, for Adrian, this was a good bird, a real good bird. So as you, as people probably know, um, I've written uh, a bi-monthly column in the Free Press, Rockland Free Press, uh, for since 2007. And uh, it's, it's always intended for, well, for everyone, but especially for uh, folks who, who may not consider themselves an elite birder. I like to, I like to make it so that uh, the columns are readable, they're maybe educational, uh, uh, maybe uh, maybe funny, maybe rewarding in that in those terms. So I think all of us want to get closer to nature, and uh, through the years I've been very fortunate because uh, being so involved with birding, I uh, I've had numerous opportunities really to hold birds in my hand, and that's just kind of a fun thing. Um, this particular uh, shot here was just some random chickadees down in Cushing. And uh, I went and got some seed out of the back of my car and went up to the edge of the bushes there, did a little bit of fishing. And sure enough, two chickadees came out and be darned if one of them didn't land right on my hand and eat some seeds. And here's a, here's a hermit thrush. See his rusty tail there. This was a bird that was uh, found beside the road and uh, it was a cold morning. I think he was just cold. We got him warmed up and and away he flew. And here's a semi-palmated sandpiper. It's one of the most uh, numerous of the sandpiper species. Little tiny thing, he weighs about an ounce or less. And this bird here could has the capacity to fly straight from Thomaston, Maine to the northern shore of South America. They can make these 2,000 mile flights. And these are, these are all birds that I have featured uh, in, the, in the book in one way or another. Here's a flock of the same birds. These are all juvenile birds. These are semi-palmated sandpipers at West Keg Marsh some years ago. And unfortunately, we don't see the numbers of those that we did see, but we can talk more about uh, that later on. Um, but these birds here as a flock may just get up after a couple of weeks of fattening themselves up and fly nonstop to South America, right out over the ocean there's no turning back. And sometimes we get these large shorebirds. This is a god, godwit, a Hudsonian godwit. It was at the harbor in Thomaston uh, one year as a young bird. And the thing is that most of these birds, these large shorebirds, fly directly nonstop from the tundra nesting areas, totally over North America and all the way down into the Caribbean and South America, nonstop close to 4,000 miles. So my book is, um, it's, it's divided into, it's an essay form. And people have told me they really like that because they can uh, sit down and they can read about a chapter, read about a certain, maybe a bluebird or whatever, and, uh, and do it that way. One person said, your book is the last thing I read at night. Every night I, I read a different chapter in it. So that's been fun to see, to hear from people. And um, it's not a field guide in any sense. It's really just that series of, of short essays and it spans the four seasons uh, and over, well, I've been bird watching birding uh, obs observations since uh, for about 60 years now. So uh, I'm getting gotten to the point where I, uh, you know, it's really, it's just part of my life. I just want to read you a, a, just a short paragraph out of the introduction of my book. This was, this would have been back in the, probably the 1950s, the mid fifties. And I was oh, eight, 10 years old at that point. And it says the number of birders or bird watchers as they were termed in those same decades was limited along the coast. The recollection of seeing two birders probing through roadside shrubbery at Pemquid Point comes to mind. I was intrigued by the binoculars around their necks and the purposeful manner of their quest. The pair stood riveted on some obscured bird, seemingly oblivious to the cars slowly driving past them. 
With great envy, I pondered what they might be seeing. I'd already come to understand that bird watchers were an eccentric bunch and perhaps even a bit ditzy. But whether bird watching implied eccentricity or ditzy, ditziness, it didn't matter to me. I was eager to sign on. And that's sort of the way it was. Uh, growing up, uh, my mom had bird feeders outside. I got real interested in birds and it was just something that, that, uh, that grew on me uh, through, the, through the years, through the decades. I've met a lot of nice folks burning, a lot of, met a lot of nice birds burning. So once in a while we get very uncommon or rare, super rarity birds. This is a great black hawk that came out of Mexico and uh, was spotted in Texas. And then the next time it was seen was in Maine. This bird got a lot of coverage on television. He was on many nights on the six o'clock news. And uh, being a desert bird with uh, bare legs, no feathers to protect him, he eventually uh, developed frostbite and that was uh, his demise. But I have a story about him in there. And we get pe uh, pelicans that come up the coast. We get brown pelicans once in a while, get white pelicans. This big guy here uh, was over in Wheeler Bay for uh, a while, one, one year. I have him in the book. Here's a bronze uh, cowbird which uh, this was the first time that one had been seen in New England ever. And it was seen in Rockland by a fellow who just happened to know about, uh, know his birds pretty well. And he looked out, saw a big flock of black birds and one of them had uh, reddish eyes. So uh, he, he picked up on that and uh, lots of people came uh, to, uh, to see it. And I was told that uh, the neighbors were warned that some nutty people might show up with binoculars, but that they were harmless. So that all worked out well. Here's a mew gull, which is a Eurasian gull that uh, I've been looking for for a few years. Uh, would always look through the ring bill gulls over in Thomaston out in the back parking lot. And one day this bird was there. Uh, very unusual gull, a beautiful gull. You can see he's kind of molting there. And then I have owls in the book. There's the, there's the moon behind a, a hawk owl. And of course, I, we have to talk about barred owls. I have them here in my neighborhood and maybe some of you do as well. Who cooks for you? That's what they say. <laughs> Who cooks for you? In fact, I heard one the other uh, morning early. And then snowy owls, uh, they've arrived, uh, at least one or two of them have locally. Um, and some years we have uh, numbers of them, uh, eruption years they're called, when, uh, when lemmings, when the food shortages are, are uh, short up, up in the northern regions. These guys will come down here, they're a day hunting owl. So uh, uh, you might see them actually out just hunting or you typically you see them standing still in a in a field or on a log or something. Uh, a beautiful owl and a big owl, big powerful owl. And unfortunately, some owls, some birds are hit uh, by struck by vehicles. And uh, I have an uh, essay in there about road kills. Some statistics on that. Uh, this great horned owl had clutched a crow probably on the night roost. And then when he was crossing the highway, uh, there in the morning, they both got uh, hit at the same time, and the owl still had a clutch on the crow at that point. Okay, red-tailed hawks, they're pretty numerous around uh, the coast here. Uh, if you see a, a big, uh, robust hawk with a light-colored chest sitting on a tree or a pole, it's probably a, a red tail. That's the most likely uh, scenario, and he does have a brick red tail. It takes a couple of years to get that. And then, of course, we have peregrine falcons uh, in the area. They nest now on the uh, towers over at the uh, Thomaston, the Dragon Cement Plant. They also uh, winter in Rockland uh, quite a few times. They've wintered in Rockland. A pair, uh, uh, a larger uh, female and a smaller male. That's the way they, they go. This guy here has his morning breakfast of a, of a Rockland pigeon heading back to, uh, to the E theft. And then I have a story in there about the year that I put a big uh, turkey 
domestic frozen turkey out in my backyard and this raven showed up, guarded it all winter. And here he is, here's the raven uh, giving the what for to a red-tailed hawk. Just walked right up to him and said, beat it. And the hawk did beat it, he left. Not much choice when something that big is coming at you with a big open mouth, Bill. And I have an essay in there about turkey vultures. I'd studied those for a couple of years around uh, Warren here and then uh, got some uh, documentation photos of them. That I think is an interesting bird. And I have put some birds in that are rather unusual, birds that people don't always uh, see. This one is a blue gray gnat catcher. They're, they're a tiny bird anyhow, and they're, they're real, not real numerous, not real plentiful in Maine, but they do actually nest here now in some parts of the state, more the southerly parts of the state. Here's a chestnut-sided warbler, which is on the other extreme. This guy is, is just numerous. They're all over the place now. And I always tell people that back in the day when John James Audubon was going through the uh, Northeast and heading to Labrador and other places, uh, in his entire life, he only saw two of these birds. That's how rare they were in those times because they're a bird of secondary growth uh, areas. And at the time when Audubon came through, we had mature virgin forests for the most part, big evergreen forests. And there was just no habitat for these birds. As I said, now they're, they're just so numerous. And we can't leave out the sparrows. This is a, a sharp-tailed sparrow down at West Keg Marsh. These guys are marine sparrows, believe it or not. They, they uh, subsist by the ditches over there. They eat lots of uh, insects. They eat seeds. And one time I actually saw a, an, a, a parent uh, sparrow come up and stuff a little fish right down the throat of a, of a, of a fledgling that was running around there in the mud. So it, there was, there, they are a fish eating sparrow, I have to say, at least that one was. And that's what I'm talking about with behavior is that things that you might not suspect unless you really, really look at the birds, uh, you, you just wouldn't, you wouldn't realize that things like that happen. It just takes a couple of extra minutes to really watch the bird and see what it's doing. And for me, how they interact with other species is the, is, is the best part of all. Like that raven and the red tail uh, competing for, for uh, meat. And I have a, one in there about woodcocks, a very unusual bird actually. Uh, the, the arrangement of their brain is, uh, is in an upside down position. Uh, it's very odd, but you know, when they, they feed down in the, down in the substrate in the, in the mud, and this bill here can actually open up like little forceps. It's a prehensile bill. And, if, and then he wants to be able to see while his bill is in the ground, he wants to have his eyes open so that he can uh, see if any danger is approaching him. So that's, that's sort of a, a glimpse into the book. Um, and it's, it's out now in, uh, in several of the bookstores. There are other ones in addition to this, but Owl and Turtle has it. Sherman's Books, there's five stores in Maine who carry it. Uh, I know the Sherman store in Damascana has sold a lot of copies. I'm very pleased about that. Archipelago, uh, Main Street in Rockland, uh, Mockingbird uh, Books over in Bath carries it and others. And then I have a website, donremerbirder.com. But as much as I'd like to sell books on my website, I'd much rather that you buy them at the local bookstores because we really have to support these guys. We really, uh, these small stores are, are struggling as it is now. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad I've sold quite a few books on Amazon, but I'd sure as hell like to sell more uh, Owl and Turtle or Sherman's. I want them sold here in Maine. I want the Maine people to get the, get the money. Okay, so um, I think with that, that's, Carney, that's pretty much what I had for about the book. Okay, so you can stop sharing and then we'll get you up on the screen and you can dive into some of the questions that sure. were submitted. 
Okay. So, uh, so do you want me to, should I, I should read the question and then try to answer it? Is that what you sure. Okay. So the, the question number one says, um, let's see, do bluebirds overwinter here in the mid coast? And when do they need nesting boxes? Well, they do overwinter here in, uh, in some numbers uh, over Clary Hill, some of the farm areas inland uh, there, you'll see actually flocks of them. You might see a dozen, you might see 20 uh, at a time, this time of year. And uh, as long as there are berries around, they, they, they like berries in the winter time. Um, and I know that they, they come, uh, early looking around for nest boxes. So I would say the earlier in the spring that you could get them out. Uh, some people have them out, you know, leave them out year round and just clean them out in the fall. You always want to clean them out after the season is over, the nesting season. But um, maybe it's not too early to put out uh, bluebird boxes. Um, and they, they do want to be a certain size of hole. I don't Offhand, I can't recall exactly what it is, but you can see online. If the if the holes are too large, then larger birds, starlings, and so forth, can can crowd in there. And uh, also, uh, uh, tree swallows is a big competition between tree swallows and bluebirds, and that's you never know who's going to win. Uh, it there's different outcomes there. And then someone says the second question says, we had bluebird nesting in our box birdhouses for several consecutive years. We have not seen bluebirds for two years. Why not? Yikes. Well, one thing I do know is that bluebirds are very fluky. Uh, they can they can be loyal to an area for a while and then another year they, they you don't know what happened to them. Or they might come and uh, set up housekeeping. You think, great, got them, they're going to nest. And then they leave and you never see them again that year. So, um, I guess all bets are off on, on bluebirds, except that they have benefited greatly from the numbers of uh, uh, the bluebird trails that, that have been put out in, uh, in recent decades. Let's see, advice for people who feed the birds and let their cats roam free outdoors or have free roaming cats in the neighborhood. Well, I know I've read where uh, domestic cats and feral cats kill over 3 billion birds a year. And I guess all I would say is that cats are not trainable uh, to, to not to catch birds or mice or whatever it is. Uh, so it's, and you know, belling the cat, you know, people do put bells on them, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe that's the last thing the bird hears is a nice little tinkling bell before it gets grabbed. I don't know. But it's better if you can to limit the movements of your cat and, and try to just cut it off there so that they're not out killing birds. Uh, other than loons, guillemots, eiders, and gulls, what are interesting birds we should look for on the Damascotta River this winter? Wow. Well, you you pretty much named the, the standard ones, but um, one thing I could suggest is that you, you might want to try to branch out a little bit because the loons that you might see in the Damascotta River, uh, most of them would be common loons. But also, I'm sure there were red-throated loons there because I've seen them up uh, near the back parking lot there in Damascotta before. So maybe branch out a little bit. Another good thing is to watch for Barrow's golden eyes over there. Um, we, the common golden eye is pretty numerous around here, but barrows, uh, we see those in just limited numbers. And they have a different head profile and a different white mark on the side of the bill or crescent shape. So I would say just, just look at the birds, the common ones that you see all the time, and you may see some differences and you may pick out some new species that way. Uh, where is my book available? I, I mentioned that, but it's at... Uh, in Camden, uh, Rockland, Bath. Uh, hopefully, folks got those some of those bookstores. But you probably know you probably know the bookstores in your hometown. And um, currently, the book my book is just appearing in more more stores all the time. So 
it's sort of a, you have to, it takes some time, but I know they're out there for sale and, and the, by default, you can get them on the website. So, um, so uh, since April, it seems we are seeing much more activity in our yard than past years. What changes, if any, have you noticed? Well, it seems to me that at my feeders, um, it, it's, a, it's a come and go thing. There'll be times when you'll have just swarms of birds and then there might be a dry spell. You might not have birds for a couple of weeks just for a few chickadees or blue jays or something. So I think, I think part of it goes with the seasons. And of course, uh, during migration, uh, there, there are little pulses or waves of migration where you might see a lot of blackbirds going through one day, next day you won't see any. And that's sort of the, that's the way it is, I think, with, with um, bird feeders. Um, they do, I think, well, they definitely do uh, benefit birds in the winter because um, I think feeders are credited greatly with uh, attracting morning doves uh, to the state here to stay here. Uh, the, 50 years ago, morning dove would have been a rare bird in Maine. And now, you know, there, there are so many of them that the legislature even considered a hunting season on them at one point, which they didn't do, but they considered a limited season on them. So um, feeders do have an impact. I think the most of the time you're gonna see the big activity after a snowstorm or harsh weather when, uh, when uh, wild food is temporarily uh, cut off. Uh, how do you distinguish herons on or near Damascotta River? Is there rhyme or reason to them hanging out in salt or fresh water? Well, I would say with great blue heron, which is the most common uh, heron you're going to see around here, big, big gray bird with a light, lighter colored breast, long legs, just kind of stand there like he's totally lost interest in life. You've seen them. They're still around. They're still over at the West Cake Marsh, other places around harbors. We'll get some on the Christmas bird count. We always do. But um, as far as seeing uh, herons right out in the open, unless you're at a marsh, again, West Cake Marsh, Scarborough someplace, then you're going to see more of a variety of uh, herons. You'll see snowy uh, egrets. You'll see great egrets, the big, tall white, uh, white birds yellow bill, black legs. Um, but again, uh, the great blue heron is, is pretty much our bread and butter bird uh, around here, around these parts. Um, let's see. Here's one. Where are the land birds the past few days during Thanksgiving? Well, <laughs> again, there it could be a little uh, lapse um, in uh, migration waves. Uh, right now, a lot of the uh, of the songbirds have gone through. Uh, now we're getting little dribbles of birds. But uh, again, you can have you can have dry spells at your feeders, and and I you know I wouldn't wear I wouldn't worry about it too much. But uh, it it just happens, I think. Um, here's one I've heard from two friends of flocks of evening grosbeaks speaks at their feeders this month. Is this a new phenomenon? Well, it is and it isn't because uh, back in my ancient days of being a child, we used to have them, a lot of them uh, around in the winter. And in fact, uh, some years later, I actually found some uh, nesting pier that was uh, around uh, New Harbor that had actually nested there, had fledglings with them. but. In the past uh, decades, uh, the uh, gross peaks have been up in the northern west western parts of Canada, in those big uh, boreal areas. Supposedly, that's what the, the researchers tell us. And uh, now, uh, spruce budworm is sort of res uh, resurging. So uh, that's that's a big boon to them and other birds, uh, boreal birds. So uh, apparently, the the numbers are, are maybe building up. And the and the gross beaks are kind of uh, favoring the the east uh, a little more than they were. I've seen a few myself, but no big flocks. But uh, if you if you do get a flock, you better go and check your bank account because they'll take your feeders down pretty fast. They can eat a lot of seeds. 
you can actually hear them snapping them in their bill when you get a good active group of, uh, of grouse beaks. Um, our chimneys in Belfast that the Swifts go to besides, are there uh, chimneys in Belfast that the Swifts go to besides Crosby Center? Uh, and the best time to see them in the AM when they leave the chimney. Uh, I'm not that familiar with Belfast uh, to know, you know, what, where they might be going to chimneys. I, I do know a lady in Warren who has them, who they nest in her chimney uh, every year. It's a fireplace chimney, a big double chimney. And uh, consecutive years, they've nested in her chimney. She can hear them up there uh, once, they, once they arrive. Uh, what are some of your favorite winter birding spots? Well, I like, I like the state parks. I like Popham. I like Reed State Park. Uh, I don't go too much south of there, but Biddeford Pool is a great, that's a famous birding place. Scarborough Marsh, of course. Um, and Marshall Point down in uh, Port Clyde is a good place, uh, especially if you want to see some seabirds, you get good looks, pretty good looks there. Uh, they, they'll just right, fly right by the point. Uh, you know, grebes and all, all sorts of ducks, sea ducks. Uh, and there's often a, a rough-legged hawk uh, down there that hunts out over there, two or three islands just off from the point. In fact, I saw one there the other morning. Um, a big, big, uh, they're a large hawk, very light on the wing. And uh, in fact, they have such a uh, preference for islands that the, the fishermen used to call them the island hawk, uh, not realizing, I guess, that they were actually a tundra species that just comes down in the winter. But that's where they would see them over grassy islands, just hovering. Um, where do the ducks in the river nest? Well, if there's ducks in the river, most rivers around here have lots and lots of ma mallard ducks. Uh, now, I'm not sure if this question means in, the, in what time of year they're talking about, but mallards will nest around marshes and so forth. A lot of the ducks that we see right now, the buffleheads, uh, oh, um, long-tailed ducks, uh, scoters, most of those ducks actually uh, nest over in the western parts of the, of the uh, continent. They, they just come here in the winter uh, to, for open water on the, on the ocean. Same thing with loons that have to abandon the frozen lakes to get their winter on the, on the, uh, the ocean. Uh, what is your favorite spot along the mid coast for spotting winter ducks? Well, again, I think uh, Marshall Point is a good spot. Pemkut Point is very good as well. Uh, all these, all these uh, point scanning places, you wanna dress warmly because they're typically, they can be quite windy, but if you want to see, want sea ducks and those types of birds, uh, those are great places to go. Uh, until it freezes up, Chickawaki Lake in Rockland is a great spot uh, as well. Uh, there, there's, there are lots of places uh, where you can, you can uh, see some ducks. Uh, Sabata's Pond near Lewiston, that's a real hot spot for waterfowl, especially. Um, it's, here's one. Blue jays are suddenly dominating my feeders. I haven't seen many all summer. Why the sudden increase in numbers? Well, one possibility is that um, blue jays, they're called partial migrants. And what that really means is that some of them will migrate and some won't. They'll stay put uh, in the north. So, uh, and, and researchers found out that even the ones who migrate they might migrate one year, but the next year they won't. So it, it's, uh, it's sort of a mystery in a way, but much of it is tied to the acorns, the mast, the, the, the food that's available in the, in the forests. And if they can't find enough acorns, they, they'll, they'll have to get out because they, they can't be in a cold climate with no food. So that may be part of it. And another thing that I have noticed with the uh, blue jays is that they they'll do what I call practice flights. There'll be there'll be groups of ten or twenty of them. You see it a lot on Manhegan Island, where they will uh, get up and together and they'll fly 
out over the ocean. They might go out there a mile and they turn around, they come right back. They do that all day long, like 10 times they'll fly out there and return. So I've never decided if that's just a way of practicing or, or just what it is that they're trying to accomplish. But see there again, there's an interesting behavior to try to, to figure out. Um, as the climate is changing, what birds are you seeing that you never saw before? Well, there's a, there's a pretty good list here in Maine of birds that, and again, going back 50 years, uh, uh, you know, turkey vultures, they weren't, they weren't real uh, common then. Um, cardinals have increased. The, probably the biggest, most noticeable one is red-bellied woodpeckers. Uh, that's a southern, southeastern species, mostly, that uh, just has turned up in spades here in the, in the state. I, I have a pair that nest every year now in my yard. They fledged two this year. You know, last year, the same thing. Uh, they've become, I won't say common, but nearly. Uh, and if, if you know their call, you'll hear them all over the place. So that, that's one. Um, again, uh, doves. Um, oh, it's hard to think at the moment of others, but there, there's, been, there's been a big uh, northern push of species. And what they're discovering is not just in the eastern part of the continent, continent-wide, uh, species are moving up in their range northward about 50 miles a year. That seems to be the, the math that they're, they're looking at. So these are, it's a gradual increase and it seems fairly subtle, but the next thing you know, you have red-bellied woodpeckers nesting in your, in your yard in Warren. So uh, it's, quite, it's quite a phenomenon really. And again, it goes back to some people say it's because we have so many bird feeders now and the birds get here and they, there's really no reason to leave because they, they'll have food all winter, they're supplied. Uh, so I'm not sure, I'm sure it's a factor, the feeders. Um, what can I grow in my very small garden to encourage birds? Well, I know for hummingbird, bee balm is a good one. Uh, and I'm not much of an expert on flowers, that's my wife's department, but we have uh, lots of colorful flowers uh, around our yard and uh, especially cone flowers as well. That's one that birds like because in, in the fall, uh, they, they like the seeds from, from cone flowers. But uh, again, you could go online and, and research that. There are, there are plants that will really uh, attract the birds and encourage them to be uh, in your yard. Here's one, just getting to know Maine, just moved here. Why so many blue jays? They are voracious rascals. Well, they are voracious rascals, but <laughs> but uh, you know they're also a, they're a very adaptive species. They're a generalist, meaning that uh, they can uh, use a whole uh, different array of habitats. They're like crows in in the sense uh, they 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 will just find their way to be comfortable in an area. And, and just settle in and, and, and make a living for themselves. Um, here's one, what, given the historic aspect of, of birds in Maine, what birds have declined the most? Well, I know one for sure is shorebirds uh, because I used to do uh, migration studies at West Keg Marsh and we used to have so many birds there in the, in, on the fall migration. And it's gotten to the point now where um, we used to, we might have a flock of two or 300 black bellied plovers there back in the day. And now if I see five or six there or 10, I'm amazed. I'm, it's like, a, it's, a, it's a good bird because right now the numbers, they're just declining worldwide. Uh, shorebirds are in big, big trouble and they're trying to figure out exactly why it's it's a tough um, you know thing to determine, I guess. But um, they're definitely not doing well. And grassland birds are another category because we've lost so much area of grasslands uh, in the past decades. Uh, as farming uh, went out, you know, every, so we've used so many farms uh, here in Maine in the past, and so it's bobolinks, it's meadowlarks. Birds of, of those types, 
uh, that are just um, for loss of habitat, for one thing, uh, just uh, not here anymore in the numbers that they used to be. Um, tips for seeing owls. Well, th that's a tough one because owls are, are fairly secretive uh, birds, but uh, I would say the best times to, to hopefully see an owl as uh, if you can be out in the early morning, just as it's getting light, or you can be out in the afternoon, just as it's getting dark, because those are the times when owls will come out and start uh, hunting for the night. They, they might come out and, and just uh, sit, be sitting on a, a roadside uh, a wire or a tree. And of course we have uh, day hunting owls. We have short-eared uh, short owls. We, we've seen a couple of those recently. And um, of course, snowy owls are, uh, you know, where they are, where they are when they, when they come here. Because uh, I know one one year, I don't recall what exact year it was, but there was a and it was an eruption year where I had never seen so many snowy owls in Maine. One example, I was w looking at the airport, the airstrip over at Owls Head Airport, and in one binocular view, there were three snowy owls sitting together all in one view. I never would have seen that before. That was, that was amazing. So, uh, so you know, be listening if you, cause they, they do vocalize uh, a lot. Yes, Carney. So I just said, we've got more questions in the chat box when you're ready. I, I guess I'm ready. I think that's the end of my, yeah. my page. Okay. So one of the questions is, have you ever rescued birds and contacted avian haven? Many times. Yep. And uh, I can't say enough about AV and Haven, how good they are, how effective they are, how dedicated they are. They also have a uh, group of volunteers who will, runners who will come and uh, pick up a bird. I remember I had a, um, uh, I guess, I guess it was an owl one time. Anyhow, I, I called Avian and they said, yeah, uh, you don't have to drive all the way over here. Uh, this lady will meet you in uh, Rockport and take the bird, and that's just what she did. I've done that oh, four or five times. So they, they're a complete uh, service outfit. They're, they just want to uh, do all they can to uh, uh, rehab birds. Right. Okay, thanks. So um, how long will the buffleheads be here, and do mergansers winter here? Yes, they, yes mergansers do winter here common megansers, hooded megansers, and red-breasted megansers. We have three species that will, that will stay here through the winter, probably into April. Hooded megansers will stay here and nest. They nest in the state. Buffleheads will leave. They, they head uh, back west, uh, way back to, to, uh, to nest. So uh, when, when do uh, the buffleheads leave? I'm sorry? When do the buffleheads leave? when yeah. i'm going to say i'm going to say maybe april you might be the last of seeing them but they, they'll they're here in by the hundreds right now thousands i guess just about every small pond has buffalo heads in it all of a sudden okay great so another question do woodcocks always walk in that special funny rocking back and forth way <laughs> yes they do they do uh they do that in the springtime, when, especially when during the mating uh, season, uh, they will do this syncopated walk. And I, I know someone who actually got out and stopped traffic <laughs> to let the, let the bird finish its walk across the, the highway. But yeah, it's so intriguing to see that. It's very, very uh, neat to watch. So this one is going back to your the slides you showed, a picture of a bluebird eating some berries and they're wondering what plant it was. I, I think that was a multiflora rose, which is actually an invasive plant that's pretty much taken over, you know, everywhere. Uh, they, they were it planted originally as hedgerows, you know, windbreaks and so forth. And, the thing is that they're they're just they just creep and crawl they go all over the place so but I I think it was uh, multiflora rose uh, buds yeah, I mean uh, berries. Mm. So this person's wondering if there's still whippoorwills in Maine. If so, where? 
Well, there aren't many, uh, I don't think, and they, they were common. I Actually, I have one in, uh, story in my book about whippoorwills too. But um, yeah, in my childhood, that was part of summer. You'd always, I could open my window and just go to sleep listening to a whippoorwill, also, you know, big part of the summer. Now um, we're looking hard just to find some. And there is, by the way, a study going on uh, where they ask people to go out and and uh, do a citizen science project. Uh, Logan Parker, I believe, has that program. But um, it's hard to even find them in Maine now. That They've really dropped right off the, the chart. Mm. OK. So here's someone who saw a hawk attack and eat a blue jay, which appeared to have a full crop from our feeder. They're wondering if you would like to see a photo of it. And so if you know I would. So why don't you give, is there a way people can reach you, Don, if they want to share a bird sighting or something like that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll just give you a, a Hotmail address, OK? The people, if people want to, I don't know, can you write it down? Carmen? I'm going to write it in the, I'm going to write it in the chat for everybody. So go ahead. Okay, yeah, so it's S-H-E-R-R-E-A-L, share real. At, yep. hotmail, at hotmail at hotmail.com. Okay, so Don. Okay, great. I'll put that in the chat. And That's then let it. me see what else. So we've got some other things going here. What's the best combination of winter bird food? Oh boy. Well, I'll tell you, you can't you can't beat uh, black oil seed for for most birds. They just absolutely love that. And if you really want to get fancy, you can get meaties, which are the the uh, black oil with the most of the uh, hulls removed. Meat, they love meaties. Uh, some of the you have to be careful with some of the seeds um, because they're the little tiny seeds that you throw on the ground. Birds will eat some of those, and some of them they'll just leave. But the key thing also is to not to not to leave. Uh, feed in a feeder for an excessively long time. You want to, you want to, you don't want old uh, seed in there because it can get moldy or, you know, actually make the birds sick. And it's also a great idea to periodically just clean your feeders because uh, we have had outbreaks of um, uh, conjunctivitis and eye disease that uh, birds can, can transmit to each other at feeders. At a dirty feeder, you know, they're just rubbing their bill down in there. Next thing you know, their eyes are all uh, uh, watery and swollen. So we don't, we don't want that. We don't want to harm the birds. Okay. Where do small birds like chickadees go uh, during storms like the one we just had? Yeah. Well, especially this time of year, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this time of year, um, most of the chickadees, they're, they're in a hole somewhere. They go in a cavity. Excuse me, just a minute. I've got to have a drink. Must be that black oil sunflower caught in my throat. We're, we're just so you know, we've had some people just commenting, saying they love your book, that this has been a great presentation. We've got a few more questions. And sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, the chickadees, will they'll go into a, a, a little hole at night. And it's fun because it, now here's one watching on a cold morning when the chickadees come to your feeder, look at every one of them and see, you're going to see some that will have a J shape in their tail where they crammed into a little tight cavity. And for half the morning, the tail will be J shaped. It'll just be pressed over to the side like that. And gradually it'll straighten out. <laughs> but that's just from being uh, inside of a, cav a tree cavity and huddled in there. They also uh, drop their body temperature at night turn down the thermostat, go into hypothermia and sort of just make it through to the morning. And they're ready in the morning and on a cold morning, they, they want to get, they have to eat. They have to get right out and eat. Hmm. Uh, another question was um, looking back to the photo of the raven and hawk, the hawk yeah. seems unusually small. Was there an unusual camera angle or was that really the perspective? No, it, it was probably a male, a red tail. With raptors, the the males are smaller and sometimes as much as a third smaller than the females. All the female raptors, the eagles on down, uh, the female is, is quite a bit bigger, more powerful. 
And actually that's a good thing because you've got this big powerful female who can catch larger prey and you have the smaller male who's maybe more agile and can catch work on smaller uh, prey items. So it, it's a good th trade that uh, nature has made there. Hmm. So going back to whippoorwills, um, have the whippoorwills gone farther north or maybe just less around overall? Oh, I, I think definitely less less around overall, for sure. I mean, it's just it, it's it's just amazing to me that uh, I'd have no idea where to go out and hear a whippoorwill next spring. Not not a clue. Hmm. So yeah. And uh, the final question that I have, is there any progress on eliminating the lead lures that fishermen use that affect loons and other birds who rely on the water? I, I don't know. I can't really speak to that. Uh, I hope so, because it is, it's a real problem, lead poisoning in, in birds and, and so forth. But I, I don't know, uh, you know, with any uh, surety about that. Okay. Well, let me, um, I'm going to, remove your uh, spotlight and um, just so I can uh, thank you, Don, for, um, you know, coming tonight. Um, yeah. I want to just say that the um, Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge will be back in the new year with some monthly programs on climate change. Um, and you can sign up for our e-news on our website or go to our website under visit slash events and see what's coming up. And that's a uh, www.maincoastislands.org. I want to thank tonight Tina Streaker, who's our volunteer that monitored our Facebook page. And I'm Carney McRae with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. And thank you for coming and get out there and watch the birds. Right, Don? That's right. That's right. Thanks, everyone.